This is Russ Portnoy, Executive Director of the MGHS Institute for Innovation and Palliative Care, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to the fourth webinar in the 2017 MGHS and HPCO Interprofessional Webinar Series in Palliative Care. Uh, today we're going to be doing something uh, very uh, unusual and, and hopefully um, uh, very informative. We're going to be presenting a challenging case to an interdisciplinary team meeting. Uh, this is going to be a case of a patient with chronic kidney disease, and I would be uh, discussing the case with my IDT members, uh, Dr. Mara Lugasi, who is the Senior Hospice Medical Director at MGHS Hospice and Palliative Care, Joyce Palmieri, who is the Vice President for Clinical Services, and Linda Norris Sturtz, who is the Social Work Manager. These are our fi financial disclosures. So what are we trying to do with this interdisciplinary case conference? Patients with advanced illness often present with multiple sources of illness burden related to multiple complex factors. And when there is an opportunity for an interdisciplinary team to come together to assess and manage these problems, we learn from each other and hopefully uh, can convey and implement best practices in an efficient way. Today we're going to be talking about Mr. P, a 76-year-old man with chronic kidney disease, and we'll be focusing specifically on three issues, goal setting, psychiatric and psychosocial aspects of care, and strategies to address troublesome symptoms. So let me set the stage. Mr. P, uh, with chronic kidney disease, was referred to our palliative care team in an ambulatory setting because of distress related to conversations about renal replacement therapy and worsening symptoms. He was seen in the clinic this morning. He was seen by Dr. Lugasi and Ms. Palmieri and Ms. Sturtz. And we are now convening at lunchtime to talk about the case in an interdisciplinary team meeting. Um, we in this clinic have access to home health services and home hospice, but there's no community-based palliative care program available to us. So welcome, everybody. Welcome. Um, let's go over the case. Let's start with what the referring physician has asked us to do. The nephrologist note says specifically that the patient has declining renal function and is very distressed and confused about his options. The nephrologist is asking us to assess the goals and offer suggestions for symptom control. Um, this morning, uh, when I walked in and asked him what brought him to clinic, he said that he just wasn't feeling well, he can't sleep, his walking is getting worse, and he's just feeling sicker and sicker. I have his records uh, that were sent by the nephrologist before his visit. Let me go over them, and then uh, together we can talk about what his history is and then address some of the key uh, concerns that he presents with. So the review of his records show that he's had declining renal function superimposed on a long-standing history of chronic kidney disease. And he also has multiple comorbidities, including non-insulin-dependent diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and peripheral neuropathy. As I mentioned before, he came in with several specific complaints, among which was worsening insomnia. He said insomnia has been a long-standing problem, but now it's a nightly a problem, and that began several months ago. He describes both a long sleep latency and early awakening. He doesn't specifically um, attribute the insomnia to any one cause, but he notes that sometimes he can't sleep because he feels um, internal restlessness. And also, every second or third night, he says he can't sleep because his itching is so bad, particularly in the arms. He's had burning in his feet for a long time, and that's also worse, and he uh, specifically noted that as another cause for insomnia. The second thing he uh, mentioned as a specific complaint that brought him to the palliative care clinic was worsening in his gait. His history is that he's had trouble walking for several years, but now he is much more unsteady, and the problem is much worse at night. Uh, several weeks ago, the notes from the nephrologist point out that he was walking to the bathroom, he fell, he lacerated his scalp, and he needed to go to the ED for suture. And finally, when he presented to us, um, I mentioned that he said he felt just more sick. And um, asked about that, he described it like having the flu. He's more tired than in the past, his appetite is worse, his mood is poor, and he's irritable. And when asked to describe how he was functioning, he painted a picture of functional decline. He doesn't have the desire to do the things he used to enjoy doing. He's sitting in a recliner most of the day, watching television, or sometimes just sitting without uh, being occupied. 
As part of the routine initial uh, intake um, for this patient, he was asked about his understanding of his kidney disease. And he had some uh, facts, but he, there was also, a, at least in my mind, some reason for concern about what his understanding is. He said that his nephrologist told him that he was now stage four and may need dialysis soon. He said the nephrologist had told him uh, some years ago that he may need a kidney transplant, but now he said, the nephrologist said, he's not a candidate for a kidney transplant because of his uh, heart problems. When he was asked about how he felt concerning this communication from the nephrologist, he was pretty honest with, uh, at least with me, that he was feeling distressed about several things. Um, it was interesting that he said that he was uh, concerned and even a bit angry about his nephrologist saying that the decision about having or not having dialysis was actually his, the patient's, to make. Uh, what he said was, I don't get this. I have to have dialysis, right? And he expressed concern about his nephrologist maybe not being clear about that. But at the same time, when asked what, what dialysis meant to him, he wasn't clear about what it would do to his quality of life or to his life expectancy. And he also thought that the nephrologist may not be telling him the full truth about the kidney transplant. He was offered that several years ago, or at least there was a discussion about it, and now he's, he's been told that he's definitely not a candidate. Now, there's some additional things um, in terms of his present illness uh, that I got from the initial intake. He hasn't changed any medications. He isn't trying any new over-the-counter medications. There's been no recent change in diet, no recent travel or exposure. He isn't febrile. He hasn't had night sweats or edema. He hasn't noted much of weight change. Uh, as I mentioned before, his mood has changed. He's much more irritable and amotivational, but he also says that he doesn't have any difficulty thinking and no problem with his memory. Now, we'll go back to his records and uh, talk a little bit about his comorbidities before you all fill in some of the details that you got when you saw him in clinic. Now, as I mentioned before, he's had chronic kidney disease for a long time, and that was attributed to his hypertension and his diabetes. His uh, GFR began to decline about 15 years ago. Three years ago, it became less than 40, and that was the time at which his nephrologist first brought up the possibility that he may need renal replacement therapy, and that was the discussion in which the transplant was initially brought up. Mm -hmm. During the past three years, his GFR has varied between 30 and 40, and he has been developing some complications of his uh, kidney disease, including anemia and hyperphosphatemia, both of which have been treated. Then two weeks ago, his laboratory testing showed that his GFR had dropped to 20. At the same time, it was noted that his hemoglobin had declined from 10.5 to 9.6. His diabetes, however, um, remained stable. But this, was, this reflected a significant decline in his renal function that, in turn, uh, precipitated the discussion that his nephrologist had to him, and that seemed to bring out all of this stress, which led him to our door today. Now, a couple of other things about his past history from his record, and then we'll um, talk about the things he told us today more specifically. As I mentioned before, he's a vasculopath, and he also has a history of peripheral neuropathy. Uh, these things have happened even though his diabetes, which is a long-standing problem, has been relatively well controlled for the past five years or so. His vasculopathy takes the form of both cardiac disease and peripheral vascular disease. He's had three myocardial infarctions. He's had a coronary stent placed. He continues to have angina occasionally, and his last EF is uh, only 45%. His peripheral vascular disease is quite severe. Uh, three years ago, he needed a balloon angioplasty for fempop arterial obstruction, and about six months ago, he actually needed an amputation of a gangrenous toe. His peripheral neuropathy has taken the form of uh, both the positive symptoms that I mentioned to you before, the burning that he has in his feet, and also um, loss of sensation, including impaired proprioception and the uh, limited ability to perceive pain and light touch. This was noted in his records as dating back years. The proprioceptive loss presumably is why he's got a positive Romberg sign, which was, you know, that sign where he closes his eyes with his feet together and immediately gets unsteady and falls. That was noted in the, in the records. And also he was noted to be ataxic uh, in a couple of notes that came with him from the past three years. 
as I mentioned before, he's got burning paresthesias in his feet and just the legs, but um, they've increased recently, and I think um, I mentioned that he attributed some of his insomnia problems to that. He also has hyperuricemia with no gouty attacks. He's had moderate depression four years ago and a recent fall uh, that I mentioned before. These are his medications. As you can see, he's taking four medications for hypertension. He's on a statin. He's on a drug for his high uric acid. He's on two medicines for diabetes. And he takes aspirin, calcium, and erythropoietin, that drug for his anemia. So he takes lots of medications, some of, some of which could have some side effects that might be contributing to some of his uh, recent problems. Let's talk about that in a minute. Now, Linda, I know that you saw him and uh, some of the information on the intake form about his social history. You, you got a little bit more color commentary on that. Would you fill us in? Well, you know, I just want to note and repeat what you had said earlier. He came in very distressed that he was in, he led with the fact that he was very distressed about being put in a position of making his own medical decision, he felt. So that was the first thing that that uh, he presented. He has been married for 35 years. He has reportedly a very good relationship with his wife. He has a lot of concern about her. She is um, a working full-time nurse, LPN. So that was one of the issues that he discussed. He has two sons who live nearby um, and gets along very well with the sons. One is closer to him than the other. You know, we'll discuss that later because there are some issues about possible health care proxy discussions, you know, involving both of the sons who feels that they're more um, capable of, of helping the father. So, you know, Mr. P is concerned about that. Financially, um, they're a little bit concerned also because while he is receiving Social Security, the wife's salary makes a big difference in their lifestyle. So if I could just say as from the nursing perspective, when I saw him, he was very anxious and like you say, very concerned about his wife. But the real issue for him when I saw him was that burning, burning pain that he was experiencing in his feet. And he also shared with me that in terms of advanced care planning that he completed a form during a recent hospitalization. However, he was not able to find it, couldn't really recollect exactly what it said. And he said his oldest son makes decisions in the family. So um, I didn't know, uh, Linda, the relationship with the two brothers or anything like that. We didn't get into that. OK. And again, his intake form also noted that he's an English-Spanish bilingual. And uh, we always ask about religion, as you know, and he's uh, a Catholic and observant. Um, other things from the form uh, in terms of substance use history, he did smoke quite a bit 25 years ago. He has a 100-pack year history, but he denies any recent smoking, uh, never used alcohol uh, except uh, socially in the past, and he's never had a, a, any other issue with drug, um, drug abuse or misuse. Um, the advanced care planning information that we got in the uh, intake form uh, is exactly what you just said, Joyce, that he, he's acknowledged filling out a form, but he doesn't know what it, what it is. So right. we have to assume he has no advanced care plan. Exactly. Right. Uh, family history was pretty straightforward. Um, his mother died of lung cancer at the age of 72. His father had an MI at 61, and then uh, when he died, he had early Alzheimer's disease. His brother is 65 and also a vasculopath. He has a history of a stroke and an amputation of a leg. And his uh, immediate family, his wife and children, are healthy. Uh, the review of systems uh, documentation that we use um, first noted the symptoms that he came to clinic with. And he's, he's definitely um, someone with significant symptom distress. Uh, he has fatigue, anorexia, dysphoria, insomnia, nocturnal itch, nocturnal restlessness, gait unsteadiness, and leg and foot paresthesias. And we touched on these in the last few minutes. Um, he's quite distressed, and, and I, the sense I got from talking to him is that the distress will travel from symptom to symptom. Sometimes he's most concerned about his burning in the feet. Sometimes he gets itchy and sometimes restless. 
And sometimes that insomnia just seems to be the most distressing thing. Uh, when, he, when he's active, he feels some shortness of breath. But that was also noted. And he also is dizzy when he stands up. And he's constipated. So Dr. Lugasi, you had the opportunity to examine him. Can you fill us in? Sure. So on my exam of his skin and his extremities, I noted that he had some excoriation marks along both his arms and legs, which went along with the itching that he's been complaining of. He had some trophic changes, and he had some lower extremity edema. Um, his HEE and T exam, cardiac, lung, and abdomen exam were, for the most part, non-contributory. On his neurologic exam, he was alert and he was oriented. He was quite dysphoric appearing. Um, other than that, cognitively, he appeared to be intact. He had normal language. He was able to provide a very detailed and, and comprehensive history. Um, he had normal strength with no drift. Um, his sensory exam did show that he had some diminished light touch sensation below his mid-calf and diminished proprioception in the toes, which is, of course, consistent with the neuropathic uh, pain that he was describing. Um, his finger to nose was normal. He did have some mild asteresis. Um, of note, his gait was wide-based and pretty unsteady, and he had absent dependent reflexes. I was actually um, a bit surprised about the asterixis because he presented as being so lucid and mm -hmm. cogent. But that asterixis would suggest that he has a mild organic brain syndrome, right? Exactly, and certainly consistent with the underlying uh, metabolic yeah, changes. Obviously important in trying to sort out how, what the plan is in terms of his symptoms and other issues. So um, we need to develop a plan of care for this 76-year-old man with stage 4 chronic kidney disease, multimorbidity, and multiple sources of illness, burden, and distress. Um, the challenges for us are pretty clear. It, like many patients with very complex medical, psychosocial, and related concerns, um, we, we can try to identify the domains that are the most uh, relevant and the, most, uh, the ones we should prioritize. But how do we put those all into a plan of care right now? Uh, is more assessment needed? What would be the priorities for this visit? And what is the plan going forward? Uh, as usual, we'll have a little discussion now. Hopefully, we'll come up with a plan that makes sense. And then, uh, as we usually do, either Joyce or Linda, you'll reach out to him by phone this afternoon. You'll share with him our initial plan. And then we'll make a decision um, in the next few minutes about when we bring him back. Because I think with a patient this complex, we would usually talk about an early follow-up. And I want to be clear that when we put that in the schedule, we know what we're going to do with that, that, exact, that uh, second visit. Yes, the plan was that Linda was going to contact him because I also did find him very angry very irritable. Uh, he was really focused on the nephrologist and the conversation that they had related to uh, the dialysis. Mm -hmm. And he really felt upset that, you know, it would have to be his decision. And he was really looking for the doctor to tell him what to do. And so I think, uh, you know, his dialogue with Linda was, I think, much more successful in terms of his psychosocial needs. I think the um, I, I think the um, point you're raising, Joyce, uh, you know, we, when we sat down to talk about the case, we sort of conceptualized that in, in terms of goal setting for this patient. And that did seem to me, and I think, I think Linda's nodding as well, that seems to be a very high priority issue for him. It's driving yes. lots of distress. And so I think, you know, we, we have many domains that we could discuss in this case, but unless you all disagree, I'd like to focus um, our discussion now on goal setting the specific issues um, raised by the, the potential for a psychiatric disorder, whether that's, in, that's part of the issue we're dealing now and other psychosocial concerns. And then, of course, what are, we going to, what are we going to do to make him less distressed from his physical symptoms? I would think that, you know, from my point of view, to start with, and I know we discussed this before, to start with um, ascertaining, having clarity as far as what the nephrologist really meant, because I don't know how to move forward with them without having some clarity regarding what his choices are, you know, how sick he really is, because there's a lot of confusion around that. And I think that's initially where his, the most of his concern, anger, and confusion comes from. Okay, so let's talk about goal setting in this patient. Um, what should a discussion with the patient include? Is more information needed? And 
Linda, you just pointed out, and I think we all agree, that the communication from the nephrologist to the patient um, is contributing to his distress. We don't know what the nephrologist said. We don't know what the patient heard. Right. We don't know what if he if he gets dialysis, if he doesn't get dialysis. Right. What would be the outcome? Uh, what what would be the next step? So um, so let's let's talk first from our perspective because obviously we need to bring the nephrologist into this discussion, but we want to make sure that our questions are accurate. So I mean, Dr. Lugasi, you've had experience with patients like this before. I mean, how would you frame? the decision to get dialysis or not? Was it appropriate if the nephrologist actually said the decision is the patient's? I mean, of course, it is the patient's from the perspective that it's his body. But in terms of the risks and benefits and the potential for uh, prolongation of life, what was the nephrologist trying to say? Right. So I, I think, of course, it is ultimately the patient's decision, but we want to make sure that he has the appropriate information to make an informed decision. And when Someone like this patient, of course, is considering dialysis. It's really a balance between, on one hand, the prognostic information, and we need to ask ourselves uh, and be able to inform this our, our patient, um, would it prolong his life, and, and by how much? And those are, some, I think, some things we need to think about, weighed against what is the actual impact that the dialysis um, will have on our patient, both in terms of potentially improving some symptoms, but also in terms of a potential decline in function and the amount of time that going on dialysis is going to impact him in terms of the time he's going to have to spend in the hospital and as part of the medical assist a system going back and forth between the dialysis. So when we look particularly at our, our patient here, I think it's really, and I think that the nephrologist is really on the right track in terms of questioning whether our patient would even benefit from it. Of course, if we look at dialysis overall, it's a, it's a life-prolonging therapy. It can prolong someone's life by years if we compare it to someone undergoing what we would describe as conservative therapy. But if we look specifically at our clinical information here, we have a patient who is 76 years old. Um, he has extensive medical comorbidities. He has advanced cardiac disease. He has severe peripheral vascular disease. He's shown some recent declines in his overall functional status. And all of those things together sort of puts our patient into a subset of, of people who tend to not do as well with dialysis. And if we compare conservative management versus him receiving dialysis, the overall extension of his life may be, end up being negligible at best. And one of the things I would like to make sure when we talk to the nephrologist is that um, to put on the table the possibility of a, of a trial with defined endpoints. Mm -hmm. Maybe the patient doesn't understand that dialysis can be stopped. Mm -hmm. And I think in this case, it's putting myself into the shoes of a patient like this when the information about prolongation of life can't be stated categorically and the symptom burden from dialysis may be as bad as the symptoms that get relieved by not being uremic, mm -hmm. it's a very hard decision to ask a patient to make. And depending on the kind of person he is, he may want to say, look, I'll go for it, I'll go for it, but if my quality of life is not improved, I don't want it. And we, I want to reassure him with the input of the nephrologist that that course is something we could follow. We could help manage him over time. Um, I think, I, it, excuse me, I think it's also important to, like, to, to for us to ascertain, and, and I only saw him this one time in the mm -hmm. clinic, but in, him coming back and that we can be available to him, but involve his family, you know, a family meeting, discuss with the son, uh, discuss. He was very concerned about his wife at, at the, mm -hmm. the clinic, and she's working. So, I mean, what does that mean for them if he's getting dialysis three days a week, they have less time together. You know, he may have more understanding of, of, of what's ahead of him than we realize even. I don't think I felt that I had enough time with him to really be able to assess that. And, and I think the uh, issue about how we have this discussion with him is very, is very crucial. I'd like to propose that we try to have the nephrologist there for the discussion, either remotely, uh, video conference to, or teleconference in, or even come, come to clinic and sit down with him and his wife uh, and with uh, our team and have a discussion about 
prognosis, symptom burden related to the dialysis, what would be done in terms of a permanent catheter, all the details. That's an excellent idea. And that would be the and most I, helpful I think the other thing that it, it will be helpful to emphasize in this meeting, which hopefully we'll have with a nephrologist, in that it's not a choice of dialysis or nothing, but that it's a choice of dialysis or what we would describe as conservative therapy. So if he opts after discussion that it's not appropriate or dialysis isn't consistent with his goals, uh, we can reassure him, and I think we can reassure him along with the nephrologist, mm -hmm. that there is still a role for active medical therapy, both in terms of the complications of the renal failure, like the electrolyte abnormalities and the anemia, and also helping with symptoms as well. And we can continue to be involved, and the nephrologist can continue to be involved. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think the choices for him will be to, to still hold off having dialysis and wait to see whether his uremic syndrome worsens to have dialysis as a trial, to make a commitment to dialysis, or to make a commitment never to have it. And we need to get more information on the table and allow him to talk with the specialists involved. I think also that we can probably, at this point, reinforce that there is nothing nefarious happening in the decision that he's not a, he's not a transplant candidate. Um, he obviously heard that in, in the context of not being clear about what was being offered. He heard that with a little bit of suspicion. And, um, and I don't know where that's coming from. We don't know him well enough to know if that's his personality style or if that's a, a new process, but it's not healthy for him to have that, those feelings about his nephrologist. And I, I would personally feel comfortable saying that even today we can tell him that uh, the medical situation being what it is, he's not a candidate for transplant. Everybody agree with that? Yes, yes. yes. I, I, I don't know what they know, if anything, about hospice. You know, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing, too, whether the nephrologist thinks that that would be a direction that we would go in um, in the future for him. Yeah, uh, and thank you for bringing that up, because I think um, I know from my own personal um, experience, I always like to just make sure we're all on the same page as a yep. team and with the primary doctors or the, the physicians of record about hospice mm -hmm. before um, we sit down with the patient. Yeah. Because bringing it up in a way where there's uh, where there's uncertainty or confusion right. on the treat on part of the treatment team, I don't think is is another unhealthy thing that patients experience too often. And he's angry so enough. Much. So, so Dr. Lagasse, just in terms of medical eligibility, I'd like your opinion about that. Do you think if he opts not to get dialysis, is he medically eligible for hospice? I would say that he's probably heading in the direction of becoming medically eligible given the de recent decline that he's having, but that we're not there at this point. Um, in terms of him being eligible for hospice, we're looking at a lower uh, GFR. We're looking at some further indications of complications of the renal failure like hyperkalemia and some further decline in function. Uh, it's always unpredictable, so we don't know how long he may remain in this state, but if he declines more rapidly, he may become eligible for hospice soon, assuming in the, in, in the case that he opted not to pursue dialysis at this point. So I think there's from so much new information now, and there's a recent decline, so I think that for us to introduce hospice at this point in time would be premature. I mean, there's a lot that he and the family need to process and understand and clarify and go through before they start to think in terms of hospice. We're not even sure he's hospice eligible. Yeah, thanks for saying that. I, I was going to propose that just as a team, we agree we won't bring up hospice at this time. It's, it is premature. Yeah. And it might so let's, preclude them going more easily into hospice in the future if we jump the gun like that. So let, let's turn and so I think we have a plan. Um, Linda, you'll be calling uh, the patient this afternoon. Yeah. Uh, you'll convey our support for the nephrologist perspective that he's not a transplant candidate, will acknowledge that there's some um, lack of clarity about the options going forward, and we'll try to schedule an early meeting that will include our team, the nephrologist, and the family, if he wants the family there, to have a discussion in which all the data are presented, and we'll try to end up with a specific plan relative to dialysis. Right. And we'll also ask him if he wants just his wife present or if he wanted his sons as well. So I, I want to turn, in terms of our uh, discussion and generating a plan of care, to the issue, um, this, uh, the second domain that we discussed, the psychiatric and psychosocial concerns. Uh, I found myself being uh, confused about where the patient 
is how best to understand what we saw. He was a patient who was very distressed. Uh, intermittently during the morning session with us, he was angry. I think, Joyce, you saw him far more <coughs> angry than I did, but, um, but he was suspicious and he was dysphoric. Dr. Lugasi, you found him to be extremely dysphoric. Mm -hmm. He actually laughed at some of my better jokes. <laughs> so I thought that, you know, this, I think this patient was fluctuating even in the, in the couple of hours that he spent with us. And then, Dr. Lugasi, you found that he had asterixis. Mm -hmm. And given the fact that he's got declining renal function, um, severe comorbidities, and multiple drugs on board, multiple centrally acting drugs on board, it wouldn't be surprised surprising that he has uh, some organicity. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, should we understand his, his mood disorder as a as, um, uh, reactive depression related to his current circumstances, the lack of certainty about his diagnosis? Does he have an, a, a clinical depression? If he has a clinical depression, is it organic? Is this an organic mood disorder? Or does he, or because he had a depression in the past, is he somebody who has a recurrent major depressive disorder, and now he has another episode of depression. Uh, I'm finding him very confusing, and I'd like to get your opinions about mm -hmm. how you interpret what you saw in terms of his mood. Well, by his own report, he doesn't really have a history of depression. He reports that four years ago he did have what sounds like a situational depression. It was when his brother lost his leg, and, you know, the implications of that were very, very distressing for him and he did respond to medication. He doesn't remember what medication it was, you know, so that would be something that would be explored. He also was forward-looking. He enjoys being with his grandchildren. He was able to laugh. Um, and he also reported, you know, that he's used to being a big, strong guy, and getting used to this new identity has been very, very difficult for him. So he doesn't have a history, you know, whether or not this is something that needs to be treated with medication. I didn't see him as depressed. It was more uh, his focus was on that conversation with the nephrologist, but also, too, uh, clinically, the, the neuropathic pain, the burning pain in his feet. I mean, not to add some more to the polypharmacy, but I was just wondering, you know, after uh, Linda speaks with the son and perhaps we have this goals of care discussion together, whether we would introduce uh, a neuroleptic agent for this. Dr. Uh, Lagasse, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think it's a possibility for, to, to focus on treating some of the physical symptoms and to kind of link it to the, the depression or the potential depressive disorder that we're talking about. If you think about the really the web of, of symptoms that he has, he does have the neuropathic pain, he does have the, uh, the itching, he does have the overall sense of restlessness. And it's very possible, it's difficult to say definitively, but I think it's very possible that all of these things are affecting his sleep, affecting his night, maybe increasing his level of frustration, maybe having a significant effect on his mood. So it's very possible mm -hmm. as well that in addition to all of the psychosocial issues that are contributing, that some of these physical symptoms are really an underlying contributor to his mood changes and his current behavior. So what I'm what I'm hearing, and I agree with this, um, we if, if we have a plan of care that addresses the goals confusion, and if we have a plan of care that addresses some of the symptom distress um, related to perhaps his insomnia, perhaps his burning feet, perhaps his restlessness and his itch and his burning feet, and 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 pick a drug, a single drug that may accomplish more than one thing, it would be reasonable to wait and observe what happens to his mood. It wouldn't be, uh, what I'm hearing Linda say, and, and I think I agree, it wouldn't be surprise, surprising if he uh, rebounded in terms of his mood once he felt that he had a clear plan, he's got a strong supportive family. Once everybody feels that they're on the same page and he feels a little bit more physically comfortable and more connected with his nephrologist and has a plan, you wouldn't be surprised if the irritability, um, dysphoric feelings, anger, get much better. And I agree with that. So I think I think I'm hearing that we won't specifically treat depression as a symptom, as a priority symptom today. And we'll just put that on, yes. under advisement to be reassessed to determine which way it goes. But I think it's really important since we do have the capability to set up a plan to see him every couple of weeks. 
so that he can mm -hmm. come in and address some of the issues, you know, the existential fears and his identity issues, and, and help him meet him where he is, and help him to figure out ways that he can improve his quality of life. You know, even simple things like if he's watching TV all day, what does he love to watch? You know, what is it that elevates his mood? But to work with them on a regular basis, mm -hmm. psychosocially, emotionally, spiritually, you know, to and, and bring his family in at times as well, but to have that base of support to help him renegotiate these new, you know, aspects so, of his life. So let me just frame that, Linda, because I think what you're, I, I think what, we came to the conclusion that we weren't going to view a depressive disorder as a priority problem right now, but what you're bringing up is it's not just about a psychiatric disorder, if he has one, it's about a broader issue of of adaptation to his new state, that's right, and yeah. mm -hmm. and the existential concerns and the and the psychosocial concerns that may be driving his distress. And what you were suggesting, since we have the capability in our program to allow him to come for brief therapy, several sessions with you or another counselor, um, to allow that to happen, to refer him to that, to support that, yeah. and that sounds like a wonderful plan. Um, I'd like to vote yes on that. Anyone here want to vote no on that? <laughs> okay. So we're going to be unanimous. So I think, but that's an important nuance in this case because I know in my own mind, um, that's a, the decision to view somebody as having a clinical depression that's that may be driving his functional decline, driving his insomnia, driving his distress. That's a different, in my mind, that's a different path to follow clinically than where we ended up in this discussion, which is to say he probably has the resilience to bounce back, but he's so distressed, so angry at the nephrologist, so confused about the next step. We gotta get that all together and meanwhile offer him an opportunity to talk about some of these concerns for a period of a month or two. Yes. And he would and hopefully he'll be far, far better off at the end of that period. I mean he's functioned for quite some time with these chronic illnesses. Yes. And now I think that thought of the dialysis was just what really put him over the edge, thinking how everything would really change for him. And he also has a family history that is kind of resonating in his own experience now. You know, his brother with the amputation and his mother, you know, and he was a smoker and she died of lung cancer and his father, you know, with the infarctions and... Yes, still waters run deep, they say. <laughs> So let's, let's turn to the issue of symptom distress, because I, I, I honestly believe, and this, I'm speaking from my own experience now, when a patient comes in with so many uncomfortable physical symptoms, if we're able to intervene with something relatively safe and quickly make him comfortable, it's worth a whole lot in terms of his trust of us, his, uh, his optimism about going forward, his willingness to work with us as we fiddle, out, fiddle, fiddle with other drugs and other treatments over time. So I'd like to aim for a low-hanging fruit symptom idea and talk to you all about what we could offer him that would make him feel better. And he raised, uh, as I talked about before uh, from the intake form, he raised several significant symptoms. The one he talked about when I first uh, went into him was insomnia. It's, um, he gave me the impression, in fact, I, when he first came in, I didn't actually realize he had all these other problems. I thought he was just going crazy because he couldn't sleep. So the question for his, uh, the issue for him is, are there factors driving the insomnia that we can treat medically or, and or should we give him a hypnotic to try to get him to sleep even at the risk that the hypnotic may not be well tolerated because he's got very poorly functioning kidneys? So Dr. Lugasi, you, you have tremendous experience with this, I know. Would you share with us your right. thoughts? So, so I think we have two goals. One is to really pinpoint, I think before we jump to a hypnotic, because particularly with someone with renal failure, we want to be very cautious about adding uh, any medications, particularly the hypnotic, because people with renal failure really have an increased sensitivity to the nervous, central nervous system effects of really any medication. So if we go back and think about what might be causing our patient's insomnia, like we talked about before, he has the burning neuropathic pain that's very distressing. Um, he has this terrible itching, which is keeping him up at night. And he has these sensations of, of restlessness, which we didn't go into in depth, but he did sort of express to me that he does feel this urge to, to move his legs at night, kind of aside from the itching. Um, and that can certainly be associated with restless leg syndrome, which occurs uh, with a variety of conditions, but in particular with renal failure. So our goal is try to choose 
one medication that will have the least negative impacts in terms of side effects and treat the most uh, symptoms at the same time efficiently. So all things considered, my recommendation would be to treat with a, start with a low dose of gabapentin, um, as it would treat neuropathic pain. Um, uh, there's been some evidence that can, it can be helpful with the pruritus associated with renal failure, and it's also been used for restless leg syndrome as well. So I think starting with a low dose of that and monitoring him over the coming weeks would be the, the best way to start. And by, by low dose, you mean 100 milligrams? Exactly. Yep. Start with yeah. the lowest dose. Let me just interject to it. Concurrently, we can explore non-medicine ways for him to... I was going to mention activity. that uh, since you're going to see him uh, every week or every other week, that's a perfect opportunity. Right. So the second major symptom that he presented with was his worsening with uh, gait. And um, his gait disorder is und uh, undoubtedly multiply determined. He's got a large fiber polyneuropathy with proprioceptive loss. He's had a sensory ataxia for some time. That's worse. He now has an amputated toe. That may make his gait worse. He had a recent fall. He, and he had a recent fall. So even fear of falling might make your gait worse. And he's also uh, has may have early uremia. That aster, I keep going back to that asteriscus, asterixis. He's got brain disease. And that brain disease may be contributing a central uh, manifestation to his gait disorder. I actually um, wouldn't have a whole lot of hope that we can make that better, but I'd like to make him safer mm -hmm. and, and propose as part of the plan that we um, uh, outfit him with a cane or even a, a rollator. I don't know how he'd feel about that. I'm sure he would struggle with that, but, um, but I'm open to other suggestions about what to do with this. Obviously, if he goes to ground at night, uh, he's going to be in a much worse situation. We have to really explore a safety plan across the board. And I think from, from a medical perspective, one thing I would like to get a little bit more information is his blood pressure history, um, particularly since he did note that he has these feelings of dizziness when he shifts positions, and he is on four antihypertensives. So certainly um, I'd like to go back and check uh, orthostatics on him and his next visit and, and uh, work in collaboration with his other physicians to make sure that we're not over-treating the blood pressure at this point and contributing to his fall risk. That's a great point. I think he would be amenable to using an assistive device, probably a cane. I, I really do. Good, and I, and I think that I like the concept of enlarging that to a safety plan. You know, I think I, I would. I didn't ask him, for example, if his bedroom has a nightlight. Oh, that's it. Gets up in the middle of the night, falls, lacerates his scalp. But so, there a light in the room. Yeah. You know, so I think if we could spend, um, you know, I think the next visit is a goals discussion, but perhaps with a phone call or something, just collecting some information about the home environment and seeing whether or not we can improve that would be great. Now, the third thing that he pointed out, this is, again, is his own report, his symptom distress he attributed to a general feeling of, of, of sickness. Uh, this is a hard one, obviously. Many patients say that. They just feel lousy. They feel miserable. And he has a right to feel that way um, because of his worsening renal disease by itself, let alone all of the other issues related to his psychological and emotional state and um, uh, potential uh, intolerance of his medications now. So I guess the question is, is our current plan focuses on a, a, a starting dose of a single drug to try to treat what we can treat, improving his gait with an assistive device and a safety plan. Is there anything else that you would think we should uh, focus on in an effort to make him just feel better? I'm okay with saying that this is the kind of thing we'll track over time and then, yeah. you know, when the goals are clarified and he's sleeping a little better at night, he won't, he'll, he'll feel less sick. That would be my hope. Yes. Right. And help him to be more present focused and come into the, the period of time that he is now, you know, try to help him to focus on the things that he does feel good about because that anxiety can certainly add to his feeling of sickness. So. Uh, I think that was a very good discussion. You know, we, we made the decision to focus on three priorities, uh, goal setting and psychiatric and psychosocial concerns and symptom distress. Um, I guess the question before we really solidify a plan of care is, is either for today or for the future, are there other broad areas of concerns that we need to think about with this patient? I'll highlight the one of them, which is just 
let us keep in mind the possibility you could benefit from hospice services at some point in the relative near future. I, I don't want our decision not to bring it up now it means it doesn't get brought up right. and see deteriorate. So that's right. one issue that I would like to bring up. For us to start to build that relationship with him will really set the groundwork for the future when we may have to bring up hospice. So we're building that now. I mean, it's not clear to me what his preferences are and the communication with him and his family, with his wife, with his son, and what, what, how he sees himself moving in the future with this whole concept about dialysis now and what will that mean for him. So I'd want to explore more, like, what is his preferences? What is he hoping for? How does he expect things to turn out for him with this disease, you know, knowing that he's had He's been sick for a long time, so. Yeah, I think really teasing out his preferences, like you said, Joyce, in terms of his, is, the, is time the most important thing, is functionality the most important thing, and trying to apply those preferences to his, his current condition. Yes. I think then it'll give us a, a better idea of how we move forward to when you speak with him this afternoon, Linda. And when we really get a clearer picture, sometimes maybe just that initial reaction of being angry mm -hmm. and having to face it, mm -hmm. and now that the dust settles, so to speak, right. and you speak with him again, it might be a new conversation. It's also new. Okay, so let's, um, I think we have a, our, a, our plan of care for this initial evaluation for uh, Mr. P. Uh, we'll bring him back within two weeks to have a goals discussion with the nephrologist mm -hmm. we'll, um, and his family. We'll, offer him uh, visits to the clinic every week or every other week for some sessions to talk about uh, how he can cope with this new reality, maybe have some non-pharmacological strategies about uh, uh, sleep. We'll monitor his depressed mood and we'll treat him with gabapentin in the hope that he gets some symptom relief. Sounds like a good plan yeah. to me. Yeah, sounds good. So at, at this point, um, I'd like to turn the session over to our listeners. Um, You've obviously touched on many aspects related to the management of a patient with chronic kidney disease at a very difficult point in his life. Um, I'll give you a second to collect your thoughts and type any questions or comments that you have for the panel. Here's a question. Um, one, of the, one of our viewers has asked specifically about dealing with his wife. Uh, we didn't actually bring up uh, any part of the plan of care that relates to assessing his wife or helping her with any of the issues that she's going to face if he now has to be in dialysis. So that's a very good point. I thank you for that. Maybe, Lindsay, you want to comment on that? Well, I think that ha to have discussion with him primarily um, and to bring her in early on, um, I think she needs to be there with us when we meet with the nephrologist. And he has a lot of concerns about her. I would like to, in addition to seeing him alone, um, to avail them of uh, family, you know, family sessions, and also to make a referral for her to see somebody on the outside herself. Because he's, his concern is that she's going to be going through a lot of emotional upheaval, and that her health is not you know, as good as, as they wish it was. I'm not quite certain what it is that she's struggling with, but um, I think to make a referral for her in the community would be a good way to go. We have another question, I think, related in, in a related sense, um, asking us to talk a little bit more about uh, social networks and what makes him happy. And I think that's a really, um, that's a very insightful question. And I, and I would just raise one issue related to that, and that is we've already spent about three hours on this one patient. Um, our initial visit with him this morning, the examination, now this IDT session, and now you're going to be speaking with him this afternoon. And, um, and we have as a key goal to improve his quality of life, reduce his illness burden. There are many um, potential referrals we can make. We can contact a variety of people out in his social network. He's an observant Catholic. We didn't explore the possibility that his church could be a value to him. Uh, he may be involved with other community services or, or social service organizations. We didn't explore that. And the question is, um, to what extent do we go forward with that 
given how busy we all are, I mean, I want to put that in the context. All of us are seeing many patients, and we have a panel, of, a, another panel of patients to see this afternoon. So the question is, how, how far do we go, and what are our endpoints here, and, and how do we want to engage the social environment to try to help this patient? Well, I think that to focus in on, you know, him and get from him what it is that makes him happy, what it is in his life, get that information from him. So there's not something being imposed from us, from the outside, but something that we can help him to recognize and clarify inside himself and then seek himself. He said he loves to go fishing with his grandson, you know, to bring out in him those things that make him feel most alive and happy and reinforce that. So that he and his family can do that rather than having us um, be the, the agents here. I, I think that's a good point, Linda, because also... I keep going back to when he was told, well, you could decide uh, dialysis. What did that mean for him in terms of his social networks, what he's able to do or not do? Or, you know, to him that might have been so devastating that he won't be able to do something that we're not aware of. And that's what I keep going back to, exploring further with him what it is that that dialysis really meant to him. What does that look like yeah, for him? And I'll just... Um make a comment about that because I think in our business we very commonly talk about eliciting the patient's values and preferences. But because so many patients that we treat are so close to the end of life, we tend to talk about values and preferences in terms of end of life issues. Advanced uh, planning, yes. Yeah. And in this particular case, he's not there yet. You know, he's, he's faced now with living some more life of an indeterminate duration. Mm -hmm. And the question is that we need to elicit his values and preferences, okay. but not just about issues related to dying, but issues related to what makes him living. happy and living. living. To help him to clarify. And so that's, I it? think that's a very good context. But no one wanted to address how busy we all are. Is that like, <laughs> hey, am I just busy? <laughs> but what I will say, this is what I will say to that. I think it's about priorities and and now with the help of the questioner, I realize uh, that we haven't had him seen by our chaplain, and he is an observant Catholic. And I would just say that one thing that I would put into our very busy schedule for this one patient is just outreach from our chaplain to talk about the role that his faith may play as we go forward with him. I think mm -hmm. that was, uh, we couldn't do that today, um, and, and, you know, that's... Uh, it's always good that we can get everybody here, but we couldn't do that today. But let's not forget that. And I would prioritize that one issue. Definitely. We have another question. Um, this is a more medical question. Um, somebody, uh, again, commenting about the patient's asterixis, wanted to know from Dr. Lugasi, what would be the role of starting a low-dose neuroleptic uh, like haloperidol in this patient? So I think if, if we're talking about something like haloperidol, we have to refine exactly um, what symptom we're treating. Um, I think in this case, I would uh, hold off because we don't really have a, a definable symptom uh, that would really benefit from the hal haloperidol that we're treating that's causing the patient a significant distress. Um, if, you know, and, and you can use haloperidol in renal failure, you have to be cautious at a, at a lower dose. Usually you would cut it in half as to what your standard dose is. Um, but something like haloperidol um, we might use if the patient had nausea related to the renal failure. Mm -hmm. If he really, you know, given that I think we're talking about the asteresis in, the term, in terms of an organic brain syndrome. Um, so if the organic brain syndrome sort of part of the renal failure progressed to the the place where it was affecting the patient's behavior. He was showing some, you know, some agitation or some other mental status changes. Then there might be a role for haloperidol at that point. Um, another medicine, a sort of neuroleptic, typically the first line um, would be um, olanzapine um, in renal, renal failure. But again, haloperidol at a reduced dose could be used, probably just not at this point in his illness. And I, and I think to follow on from that question, we didn't spend a lot of time on his polypharmacy. But um, Dr. Lugasi, you raised the possibility of, re of eliminating at least one of his antihypertensives because he had symptoms of orthostasis. I'd also suggest we could stop the statin, particularly with the recent study that demonstrated that patients who had the statin stopped in the context of advanced illness had uh, better quality of life and had mm -hmm. and suffered no ill effects. Um, and there may be, um, and, and if 
I think another check of his diabetes at this point would be important. I'm not sure that he needs both of his his um, uh, his drugs for di for diabetes. Anything that we would could do that would reduce his pill burden might benefit him from a quality of life perspective and also reduce his side effects. Uh, the, I, I think we have time for one more question, and it's a pretty straightforward question. Someone noticed that we opened the session by saying we have access to uh, home care but not community-based palliative care, and, um, and the questioner just wants to know what the role for home health is here. Would, is this a patient where we make a referral to home care or some other home health entity? Would there be any indication for that? Linda, that seems to be in your wheelhouse. What do you think? I think we would have to determine as we went along what the needs were. You know, we don't know um, how he's going to adjust to this period of time. We don't know if he needs any kind of physical health at home at this point in time. I mean, we could certainly refer, you know, if we needed to, to a home health care agency. But there's, this point but there's, time, no, there's no strong indication. I don't really, myself, I don't really see the need. Certainly, you know, to make the referral if his wife would want to see somebody on the outside or something along those lines, and of course, you know, make sure that he's connected with his community. But at this point in time, I, it doesn't seem to be the need here. I mean, if we were able to assist with the burning, pain in the feet, with the insomnia, I think some of that might fall into place. And uh, other than assessing his vital signs, like what would be the skilled need for the home care? And so therefore... He doesn't really have one now. I don't think so. Uh, you know, it's um, one minute to go, and I just have to ask this last question that just popped up on the screen. Um, the viewer wants to know, is there a role for our team going forward after, after things get better? And this patient has a strong relationship with his nephrologist. He's going to dialysis three times a week, and his symptoms are relatively well controlled. Is there any reason that this patient should, should still come to palliative care practice? And I'll start and say, absolutely. <laughs> this patient's course going forward is yeah. going to be extremely complicated. Uh, and it, there's going to be a constant issue of addressing um, a, a combination of things that cause him and his family distress and may need expert management of the type that we can do. And his life expectancy is not so long that my guess is that if we develop a strong relationship, we will be able to help him as he approaches the end of life in a way that uh, otherwise wouldn't be possible. We want to be able to maintain that, even if it's only once a month for him to come in. So that's all the time we have for questions. I want to thank our viewers. Hopefully the discussion was illuminating uh, and enjoyable. Um, I want to let you know that our next webinar is entitled Palliative Care and Oncology, Cancer Pain Syndromes, and that will be given by yours truly on May 4th, 2017 at 1230. Also, I want to remind you to please complete your webinar evaluations. Uh, you need that for your credit, and it really helps us plan for the future. Thanks very much.